Let's get right into it. Number 8. The Electrical Eel Shock Imagine the scene. Ancient Rome. And you've got a killer headache or maybe some gout. The doctor doesn't hand you aspirin. He shoves an electric torpedo ray onto your forehead or feet. This bizarre practice was recorded by physicians like Galen and Scribonius Largus, who used the shock from these electric fish to numb the pain. They called it the electric bath, or animal electricity. What they didn't know was that they were performing a rudimentary form of electrotherapy, or transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. The shock from the eel temporarily overloads the nerve fibers, jamming the pain signals before they can reach the brain. They accidentally discovered that electricity, even messy, slimy, biological electricity, could function as an analgesic and a muscle relaxant. While the idea of a buzzing fish on your head sounds like a truly terrible time, they were pioneering the use of bioelectricity in medicine centuries before anyone understood Ohm's law. Number 7. Drinking Gold for Immortality For centuries, alchemists and nobles across Europe and Asia were obsessed with aurum potabile, or tincture of gold. They believed that drinking a liquid suspension of gold would cure all diseases, prolong life, and lead to immortality. The reality? Most of the time, they were just drinking alcohol contaminated with gold dust or harsh chemicals. They were chasing a fantastical dream, but they accidentally stumbled upon the unique properties of gold nanoparticles. Today, scientists do use gold specifically, incredibly tiny gold nanoparticles, in medical research for things like highly sensitive diagnostic tests and as a delivery system for cancer therapies. Gold is inert and non-toxic in its pure form, making it an excellent carrier. The ancients got the method spectacularly wrong, but they were right that gold, in a very specific, minuscule form, holds genuine, powerful medical potential. Number 6. Lead Pipes for Eternal Youth The Romans. Masters of Engineering, Law, and, apparently, self-poisoning. They loved lead. They used it for everything from plumbing to cookware, and even to sweeten their wine. They believed lead-sweetened wine was superior, and ironically, that lead cosmetics could preserve their youth. What they were actually achieving was mass, slow-motion lead poisoning, a neurological affliction that causes cognitive decline, madness, infertility, and chronic pain. However, here's the science they accidentally verified. The incredible bioperistence of heavy metals. Lead mimics calcium and gets stored in your bones, slowly poisoning you for decades. While they didn't discover the cure, their civilization became a massive, tragic, multi-century toxicology experiment that clearly demonstrated the devastating, long-term effects of chronic heavy metal exposure. It provided a stark historical footnote that modern industrial nations had to relearn the hard way. Basically, they were so advanced, they invented their own slow-motion apocalypse using cheap metal. Number 5. The Snail Mucus Facial Travel back to ancient Greece, where Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, was doling out some truly bizarre advice. If you had skin irritation or inflammation, his prescription wasn't a cream or an herb, it was to crush up some snails and smear the mucus onto the affected area. Fast forward a few millennia, and you'll find $80 snail mucus-infused serums in high-end cosmetic stores. Hippocrates and his followers accidentally discovered snail secretion filtrate, which is packed with beneficial compounds like hyaluronic acid, glycolic acid, and antimicrobials. These components help snails repair their own tissue when their soft bodies get scraped on rough surfaces. The ancients were unintentionally leveraging the snail's robust, self-healing dermatological defense system to treat human skin. They thought they were applying slime. They were actually applying a complex biological cocktail that reduces inflammation and promotes cell regeneration. Your great-grandma's weird garden remedy is now a K-beauty superpower. Number 4. The Accidental Vaccine Party Picture this. It's the 18th century, and the only thing scarier than the smallpox death rate is the cure they're pushing. Before Jenner figured out that cow pus was the hero we needed, people were messing around with something called variolation. This delightful practice involved taking scabs or pus from someone with a mild case of smallpox, which, side note, there is no such thing as a mild case of smallpox, and then intentionally rubbing that charming material into a cut on a healthy person's arm. Yes, they were throwing an infectious disease party in your open wound. The idea was that this controlled exposure would give you a milder case and save you from the full-blown, 
face-melting version. And here's the kicker. It often worked. About 2% of people died from the procedure itself, but those who survived were genuinely immune. They had, completely by accident and with zero understanding of viruses or immunology, stumbled upon the concept of antigen exposure and acquired immunity. They were essentially proto-virologists using medieval bioterrorism techniques to save lives. Think of it as your ancestor's body going, Okay, fine. I'll deal with this weak version now so I don't have to fight the final boss later. Number 3. Brain Eating to Boost IQ Now we jump to another practice that, on its surface, looks like the script for a low-budget horror movie. Ancient groups, particularly in the South Pacific, sometimes practiced what's known as funerary cannibalism, consuming parts of deceased family members. While horrifying to us, the rationale was often respect and the belief that the person's strength, spirit, or, you guessed it, intelligence would be passed on. What they actually stumbled upon was the most direct, albeit horrifying, way to study neurological disease transmission. In the mid-20th century, scientists were baffled by a prion disease called Kuru that was ravaging a specific tribe in Papua New Guinea. It was a terrifying, degenerative brain disorder, and it was spreading through this very ritual of consuming the dead. This single, bizarre practice provided the real-world evidence that prions misfolded proteins, not viruses or bacteria, could be infectious and transmitted through consumption. It was the scientific smoking gun that led to a massive shift in how we understand diseases like Creutzfeldt, Jakob, and Mad Cow. So, congrats to the ancestors you accidentally proved the existence of infectious proteins while trying to absorb Grandpa's wisdom. Number 2. Fever Sweats for a Broken Heart If you went back in time and told a physician you were suffering from intense melancholy, depression, or even what we now call schizophrenia, they might suggest something radical. Infecting you with malaria. Seriously. In the early 20th century, psychiatrist Julius Wagner Jaureg pioneered malaria therapy. He noticed that some patients suffering from neurosyphilis, a devastating, brain-destroying condition, saw an improvement in their mental state after they developed a high fever. His accidental hypothesis was that the intense, sustained high fever from malaria somehow burned out the mental illness. He was partly right and partly terrifyingly wrong. He didn't cure mental illness, but he was curing the neurosyphilis. The high fever was literally killing the heat-sensitive syphilis bacteria in the brain, long before penicillin was widely available. He essentially weaponized one disease against another. This bizarre, high-risk treatment which earned him a Nobel Prize, by the way inadvertently confirmed the infectious, bacterial nature of syphilis and proved that extreme temperature could be an effective, albeit dangerous, antimicrobial agent. Your ancestors just thought a good sweat session would fix your head, but they discovered a primitive antibiotic mechanism instead. Number 1. The cure for scurvy that took 200 years. You might think scurvy, that nasty maritime disease that makes your gums bleed and your teeth fall out was an easy fix. Just eat some fruit. But for centuries, sailors died in droves. They tried everything. Vinegar, spices, even sulfuric acid. They were dying of vitamin C deficiency but didn't know what a vitamin was. Then, in 1747, Scottish surgeon James Lind conducted what's considered the first clinical trial. He took 12 scurvy-ridden sailors and divided them into six pairs, giving each pair a different supplement, cider, vinegar, sulfuric acid, etc. The pair given two oranges and one lemon every day showed a near-instant recovery. Lind, not understanding the biochemistry, simply concluded that acid helped. This didn't stop the British Navy from reverting to less effective treatments for decades. But Lin's work, the simple act of controlled comparison, accidentally established the scientific method in medical research and provided the first empirical evidence for what would eventually be identified as an essential nutrient, ascorbic acid. They were one piece of citrus away from knowing the answer for hundreds of years. That's all for today. I'll be making similar videos in the future. Subscribe to see them.